When I approached you in the park, he looked pretty down and out. Clothes disheveled, eyes bloodshot, nose running. The holidays can be hard on people. I sit next to you on the bench, the smell of your binge drinking invading my nostrils. How are you doing, friend? I ask gently. Not so good, you reply. I got fired from my job. Can you believe that? Fired so close to Christmas. My girlfriend keeps saying we're going to get evicted if I don't find something soon. Doesn't she think I know that? I reached out to my friends, but none of them will help me, because I've asked so many times before. You know, sometimes I think everyone would be better off if I was never born. You look shocked, as if you can't believe you unloaded so much on a total stranger. I'm familiar with this effect I have on people. And now, I'm sure that's not true, I say. Listen, you might not believe this, but... I'm an angel sent from heaven to watch over people like you. Why don't I show you what it would be like if you were never born? Then you can see how much everyone needs you. You sniffle. Okay. I produce a tiny bell from my pocket and ring it. Suddenly, we're in front of a magnificent mansion. Where are we? You ask. I took you to your girlfriend's. Let's see how sad she is without you. We peeked in the window at the impressive interior with expensive furnishings. Your girlfriend is at the dinner table with an exceedingly handsome man holding his hand. She laughs at something he says and strokes the hair of a beautiful child sitting next to her. But, but she's better off without me, you exclaim, horrified. Oh, I'm so sorry, I say. Let me try something else. I ring the bell and we're at your parents' house. A young man who bears a resemblance to you walks outside. Is that my brother? But it can't be. He died years ago. If I had to guess, I offered. He may be alive because you weren't around to influence him to drive so fast. I watched your face as your parents came out of the house, smiling and hugging your brother in a way they never hugged you. Oh God, you say. Take me back. Please, I, I can't stand another second here. I ring the bell and we're back in a world that you know is worse because of your existence. You run away, and I wonder how you're going to do it. Pills. A gun. Or maybe just jump off a tall bridge. I know you won't be able to live with what I've shown you. No one has ever been able to. None of it was real, of course, but you think it is. And that's enough. I remove my hat to give my horns some air. And keep walking. Looking for the next poor soul depressed during this fine holiday season. Howie woke up in the dead of night and immediately focused his blurry eyes on the wall clock. It must be past midnight. Yes, 1.30 a.m. He excitedly groped for his black marker and squinted at his calendar as he crossed off another day. Only eight more sleeps to go. Santa! Screamed the children. Howie looked up with a start. He must have dozed off again. He saw a big bearded man in a red suit bounce through the door. Ho ho ho! Merry Christmas! Boomed Santa. Howie and the other kids jumped from their stations and swarmed Santa, who met them with open arms. Howie stood on his tiptoes and stretched his sore right arm over the other children, trying to touch Santa. His eyes filled with tears. After all of the broken promises and disappointments and delays, Santa was finally here. Santa handed out small packets of biscuits and sweets, like the ones you get on an airplane. The kids ripped the packaging off and devoured the contents ravenously. Small scuffles broke out as kids fought over the treats, but Santa just smiled. No fighting, boys and girls. Plenty more where that came from. Ho, ho, ho. 
He made time for everyone. He kissed their tired faces, hugged their skinny bodies, and listened to all their Christmas wishes and desires, which he promised that he would make come true. But eventually, it had to end. Bye for now, children. What wonderful and generous people you are, he cried. Keep on being good and Santa will give you all a lovely Christmas surprise. Mark my words. The children whined and begged, but Santa was firm. He had lots of work to do so close to Christmas. And Mrs. Claus is waiting, he added with a sly wink. After he left, Mr. Bork closed the door behind him and finished a cigarette from his shirt pocket with his skinny, grubby fingers. The children watched him apprehensively. See? I told you he was coming, didn't I? Said Mr. Bork. Now get back to work. Santa will be very upset if those presents aren't ready in time for Christmas Eve. The children trudged back to their stations. Howie then picked up the wallet that he was stitching with some renewed energy. Only eight more sleeps until Christmas. Howie reminded himself yearningly. Only eight more sleeps till his parents finally came to take him home. For the first time ever, the elves of the North Pole felt a chill in January of 1948. Only a few truly noticed it as most were still so exhausted from the Christmas season that they simply went home after work each night. None noticed the figure of a hooded stranger walking through their streets towards Santa's workshop. Or then after giving three knocks, it entered. Santa jumped to his feet from his desk when the stranger entered his office. Oh, please, sit down, Santa whimpered, his normally cheery voice collapsing under a nervous energy. As you'd like, the stranger said sitting across from Santa at his desk. Santa examined the stranger closely and nervously, clearly uncomfortable with the presence. Do you know why I invited you here? He asked. I have no idea, the stranger coyly said. Santa fumbled through some toy diagrams and the like, searching for a paper. While looking through his files, he began, Well, sir, uh, yes. Spit it out, Kringle, the stranger said. Santa stopped, a startled look on his face. Well, the fact of the matter is, we just can't keep up with Christmas. A hundred years ago, the elves and I could easily handle the wishes of every child. But the population has doubled since then. Their wishes are getting to be out of control. We just barely made it this year. But we can't go on like this. The stranger let out a soft chuckle. Well, war and famine just ain't what they used to be for calling. It exclaimed sarcastically. The desperation welled in Santa's voice. Please, can you help me? Of course, the stranger replied. A brief sigh of relief escaped from Santa, his big frame visibly relaxing. But everything has a price, the stranger continued. This is an unusual deal for me. Since I can't have your soul, I'll, I'll need something, something else. Anything, Santa sighed. The elves couldn't believe how easy the 1948 Christmas season had been. Each day's production seemed to be double or triple the same day as last year. Santa seemed more rested and relaxed than ever, and when he left on Christmas Eve, they held their first post-production feast since the late 1880s to celebrate their good fortune. When Santa did not join the Christmas Day festivities, some of the senior elves, Melody and Patrick, went to find him. Just as they got to the workshop, they saw the stranger at the door and hid behind a pine tree watching. At the door stood Santa, holding what looked like a sleeping little girl. Is that Patricia Morgan? The stranger asked. Yes, Santa replied. A sadness tinged his voice. Excellent, the stranger hissed, taking hold of the sleeping girl and turning from the door. Walking back into the snow, the stranger called. Oh, Santa? 
pleasure doing business. Patricia and it then disappeared in the blink of an eye. Is that the Patricia Morgan? Melody whispered to Patrick. She was the nicest child in the world this year, Patrick said. Mackenzie sneaked quietly down the stairs. The sound she heard must be Santa arriving with her presence. She stopped a few steps from the top and peeked through the banisters. No Santa. She frowned and looked over at the milk and cookies sitting on the living room table. Neither had been touched, meaning Santa had not come and gone while she slept. So what was the sound she heard? She was about to go back upstairs when movement caught her eye. The tree was moving, by itself. She gasped and covered her mouth, afraid it would hear her. She watched the tree limbs slowly moving, like they were stretching. Then the branches reached out and began pulling off each ornament and carefully placing them on the floor. It even peeled away the silver tinsel she had put on it. When all the ornaments had finally been removed and lay in a small pile on the living room carpet, she watched the tree twist the screws that held it secure in the tree stand. The limbs then reached down to the floor and pushed. She heard a wet, popping sound as it slipped free of the tree stand. A crackling sound followed. Then she watched the trunk of the tree split and grow legs, then began walking across the floor. Each step sounded like the creak of a rocking chair. Mackenzie was frozen in place as the tree headed slowly towards the door, skittering like some giant spider. When it finally passed in front of the stairs, the tree stopped. Several branches snaked out, shot up the stairs, and grabbed Mackenzie's arms and legs. She started to scream, but another branch wrapped itself around her head, covering her mouth with sticky, piercing needles. She was pulled down the stairs, bouncing on each step, her head smacking against the wall. Each time she tried to fight against the branches, the grip grew tighter. She could only watch as the tree grabbed the doorknob, turned it, and opened the door. The night air swept inside. The tree pulled her along as it stepped out into the night. Mackenzie shivered as the cold air assaulted her. But what really made her shake was all the other trees from all the other houses in the neighborhood dragging all the other kids out of their homes. She was pulled across the yard, over the sidewalk, and into the street, which scraped against her back and tore at her pajamas, digging into her skin. As she felt her warm blood against the cold asphalt, she looked up at the sky and saw a gigantic shape blotting out part of the stars. As she was dragged down the street, unable to scream, she couldn't help but to notice how the dark shape in the sky looked an awful lot like a gigantic Christmas tree. There were even twinkling lights. I wish Mom and Dad were here. They would help me. Surely. You see, the whole idea of Santa was ruined for me when I was five by my sister who insisted on showing me where my Mom and Dad hid the presents. She was right. There wasn't a Santa Claus. In Mom and Dad's closet wasn't clothes, but stacks upon stacks of presents for me and my sister. Even though at that point I stopped believing in Santa altogether, I never stopped believing that my Mom and Dad loved me and my sister very, very much. Tonight is Christmas Eve, and my Mom and Dad aren't home. Something I knew that was going to happen since both their kids knew there was no Santa there really wasn't a reason to hide when they were going Christmas shopping. They went out earlier today to get some last minute present deals and also something for dinner. The issue with that was that was at about 2 p.m. and it is now three in the morning and they still aren't home. I've gotten no calls saying they would be late coming home, no 911 visits that they got into an accident or have been reported missing. Nothing. Something happened after that night I found out Santa wasn't real. I immediately told my parents, but they didn't seem disappointed. They seemed worried. Honey, there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for that. Santa can't hide all the presents for every child in the world in his workshop. That would take up so much space. 
so he sends them to each parent in advance so that they can store them for when Santa comes to set everything up. I knew that was a lie, but I never told them whether or not I believed them, because the face my mom gave me when I told her I didn't believe in Santa anymore was that of pure terror. Back then I didn't know what that face looked like, but I do now. Around 2 a.m., I heard something on the roof. I sat there in silence as my sister came out of her room, looked at me and asked if I heard it too. I nodded, and that's when I heard the noise that would cause the face that my mother made that night. Shuffling in the chimney. Mind you, I'm 16 now, and have no reason to believe in Santa. I didn't need an excuse, it's just what happens. So what the fuck was in the chimney? I saw a long, decrepit, shaggy arm bend its way out of the chimney opening. It was so... long. It seemed to sense where the tree was in the living room because it started padding around the tree skirt, seemingly feeling around for something. Presents. But if it was Santa, why would he be looking for presents he's supposed to leave them? A roar erupted from the chimney base and a massive spider-like creature wearing a fake beard and Santa hat emerged from the chimney. I bolted to my room and at the corner of my eye saw that thing grab my sister and stuff her in some sort of sack. I locked myself in my room, and that's where I am now, sitting alone and cold in the dark. I looked out my window to see snow piled impossibly high, all the way to my room in the second story of the house. That's why they never came home. No one could survive that. I can hear the thing scurrying around the house and the walls looking for me. Eventually it'll find me. This thing isn't Santa. It can't be. But it is. This is why my mom was so worried, why I wouldn't believe in him and why she insisted on hiding the presents. Santa doesn't give gifts. He takes them. By any means necessary. Hey guys, The Dark Narrator here, and thank you guys so much for watching this video. Uh, I did one of these last year, and it was really good. I was very happy with it, but I feel like I have a handle on things a lot more now instead of just throwing all of these people into one video without really any planning. Like last time, I have an actual plan, and I've become a better narrator since then, and I've become a better YouTuber and a better person since then. Uh, so I think... This video will show a lot more than it, the last one did. Uh, I want to do these every year uh, with different narrators, maybe a couple of the same ones each time, but I want to keep making them bigger and better and have bigger narrators in to get you guys excited uh, and new narrators as well um, so that everybody's shown from the community. Um, this year has been the best year of my life. Uh, I have found my girlfriend through this and without this channel i wouldn't have my friends that i have now i wouldn't have my girlfriend who i love dearly and i wouldn't have all of you that makes it worth do any doing any of this um so thank you guys so much to all the people who got us to 1400 subscribers this year from 50 at the beginning of january that is crazy uh <laughs> Uh, I'm trying not to get emotional about it because, like, it actually does affect me in a huge way. Um, but thank you guys so much for everything, for making me into who I am and giving me an outlet to create the videos I've always wanted to make. And thank you just for being here always, without fail. I love all of you, and I want to say that this will be the last video of this year. I'll be re returning on January 5th. Uh, with a, no a new video, new year, new dark narrator. No, I'm not changing, but anyway, uh, January 5th, I'll be back. So please, please just keep watching. Stick with me. I love you guys. All my links are in the description as well as everybody else who is in this video. And I will see you guys next time for another one. See you in 2020.